131, I can give you, um, or now that works too. <laughs> and we could just let folks in um, in one minute and I'll open up with the poem again, Mariana video. And then from the video with Mariana, uh, Moses, do you want me to pass it over to you or you just wanna pick it up? You can pass it over, that'd be awesome. Okay. <sighs> like I'm putting my helmet on. Lock and load, baby. Okie dokie, we can let people in. Hi, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. We're just gonna take a minute to give folks time to, uh, to come in. Thank you all for joining us. Okay. Good afternoon and good evening to those who join. We're just gonna give it a minute for folks to come on and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right. Uh, good evening. Good afternoon. Again, thank you for joining us for WTF. Does Cinco de Mayo have to do with imperialism? My name is Sierra Taylor. I am the Director of Cultural Strategy with Code Pink, Women for uh, Women for Peace. Uh, we are just going to uh, have a, a really great discussion. We have an incredible lineup of artists, cultural workers, organizers who are really getting into this question, into the revolutionary history, the revolutionary legacy of Cinco de Mayo and uh, as a part of the struggle for liberation of uh, people who are poor, dispossessed, who are exploited, who have been oppressed, uh, not you know only in Mexico, but for generations to come. And what we really want to do here is to take a look at this history that's often unexplored, that's often uh, ignored or made invisible, and to be able to explore this history to look for the lessons that we can glean for our struggles today. And so I want to open us up with a poem. We're gonna get started uh, with Mariana Bolte, who is a professor, artist, and curator. And then I'm gonna pass it over to my comrade Moses, who will bring us into the second half of the discussion around the role of art and culture in revolutionary movements. What? And I'm going to mute everyone who is not talking just to make sure that we can all hear one another um and uh oh sorry um and then yeah we'll get started so this poem is called cinco de mayo by louis rodriguez cinco de mayo celebrates a burning people those whose land is starved of blood civilizations which are no longer holders of the night. We reconquer with our feet, with our tongues, that dangerous language, say more of this world than the volumes of textured and controlled words on a page. We are the gentle rage. Our hands hold the stream of the earth, the flowers of dead cities, the green of butterfly wings. Cinco de Mayo is about the barefoot, the untooled, the warriors of want who took on the greatest army Europe ever mustered and won. 
I once saw a Mexican man stretched across an upturned sidewalk near Chicago's 18th and Bishop, one fifth of May Day. He brought up a near empty bottle to the withering sky and yelled out a crito in the words, que viva Cinco de Mayo. And I knew then what it meant, what it meant for the barefoot Zapoteca indigenas in the battle of Puebla and what it has meant for me there on 18th street along among Los Ancianos, the moon faced children, the futureless children, the futureless youth dodging the gunfire and careening battered cars. And it brought me to that war, that war that never ends. The war Cinco de Mayo was a battle of that I keep fighting, that we keep bleeding for, that war against a servitude that a compa on 18th street knew all about as he crawled inside a bottle of the meanest Mexican spirits. And so again, that is Louis Rodrigo, uh, a poet, uh, an organizer, an educator, uh, and this was called Cinco de Mayo. I'll put the, the poem in the chat. Thank you so much uh, to my dear friend and comrade, Shally Barnes, who shared that poem with me today. Uh, we're gonna have a, a really great discussion for those who are just coming in. Uh, welcome to WTF, the Cinco de Mayo got to do with imperialism. I, uh, again, I'm Sierra, I'm the Director of Cultural Strategy. We, we wanted to open up this conversation because so often when you hear about Cinco de Mayo, it's either as this very hollowed, commercialized uh, uh, idea of just a party and you know drinks and tacos and sombreros and no real uh, understanding of the revolutionary history of this battle that was uh, the battle uh, in, in Puebla, which was a, a, a ragtag, a guerrilla, uh, just group of people um, who came together, who believed that a better world was possible, who believed uh, that there does not need uh, to be any slavery or, or, uh, or servitude, who believed in emancipation and liberation for all people the world over, and were able to come together and rise up in unity to fight an oppressive imperialist force. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce Mariano Bote. Mariana is an art historian, artist, curator, born in Mexico City. She is an associate professor in modern and contemporary Latin America art history at the Visual Arts Department of University of California, San Diego. Bote received her PhD in visual studies at the University of California, Irvine in 2010. Her experimental video documentaries have been shown at the Guttenheim in New York, in Bilbao, the Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid, the Anthology Films Archives in New York, the Museo Cairo Gil in Mexico, Mexico City, Red Cat, among other museums, galleries, and festivals. Bote is co-editor of Fantasma, and uh, the Zona Critica collection series. In the same collection series, she is the author of Zonas Disturbo, or Zones of Disturbance, Specters of an Indigenous Mexico and in Modernity. Bote is the founder of the Red Specter, an agitation agency at the intersection of art, theory, and politics. Mariana's most recent publications include Las Otras Jugadoras, El Neodazapetismo, and Las Practicas Artistas uh, contem Contemporanas, <laughs> Una Historia en Clave Menor. 
I am so sorry that I butchered that Spanish, but I thought it was important that we really lift up uh, uh, the language, uh, the, the actual titles of, of these books in, in Spanish and the, the, the native language, um, which is a volume uh, about uh, uh, Zapata that is published by Fondo de Cultura Economica. Mariana lives and works in San Diego, California. I had the opportunity to meet Mariana and learn from her while in Detroit, Michigan a couple years ago. Uh, Mariana was able to come and, and visit with us at the um, and explore the, the incredible artwork of Mexican artist Diego Rivera um, and uh, just really uh, brought out uh, the beauty of the worker, uh, the beauty of, of struggle, and, and uh, the power that a unified group has when they come together in, in hopes of a, a world that puts people over property and to know that we can overcome those who, who seek to oppress us. And so without further ado, I'm going to get into, uh, get to Mariana, who will talk about the history uh, the revolutionary history and legacy of Cinco de Mayo. Oh. Um, so I'm here super proud and honored to try to do a little introduction to the possibility of rethinking uh, the Cinco de Mayo celebration, right? The battle of May 5 in 1862 in Mexico, in Puebla, and try to rethink it away from um, the sort of now sort of commodified commercial American holiday that it is about drinking beer and thinking of Mexican heritage, but is actually not anymore understood in the calendar of the United States as an actual marker of a radical history, a radical history that since the 19th century has been a sort of place of articulation of solidarity, actually, not only in Mexico as the history of Mexico against the imperial colonialist forces of the 19th century in that moment, but how these actually play in the politics of emancipation and a radical project in the United States. So as I said, May um, 5, May 5, in 1862, commemorates this very important battle in which the ragtag Mexican army um, composed mostly of indigenous um, a special guerrilla forces defeat the most powerful army of that moment, the, the imperialist French army, in their attempt to expand their empire to actually, now that the newly emancipated territories of the Americas, right, that had fought the war of independence across the continent from Chile to um, to the north, to Canada, to try to attempt again to conquer American soil. And it's very important to try to recover Cinco de Mayo as this uh, uh, history. But the generation who won this battle, right? You don't win battles like that, right? Where it's like you are the, the, the small army against the biggest, unless you have a sort of long formation of the people who actually fought um, this this battle is actually the generation of indigenous um, intellectuals, artists, and politicians that were very educated in the tradition of the most European radical um, tendencies. Right? They were very much uh, in, enamored with the idea of the French Revolution. We can think of them like. Um, as the idea of these indigenous Jacobines, just like the way, you know, we have constructed the Haitian 
uh, revolution as the idea of the black Jacobines. So they, in a sense, were the left to the left of the European movements or the intellectual European. And it's very important to recover that history because if we think of an international history, we think of a history of a confrontation of the forces of the, the radical left that eventually becomes a socialist project of emancipation, right, but grows out of a tradition of revolutionary politics in the 19th century. But we need to think of Haiti or Cinco de Mayo, right, as the moment in which the black subject and the indigenous subject are at the center of this radical tradition that we should think as a tradition that is international and is the beginning of forms of resistance and anti-colonial and anti-imperialist struggle, right, uh, and war uh, to defeat the colonial imperial project of the Europeans. And Cinco de Mayo is perfect, uh, exactly that. So this generation of people who defeated the French began when they were very young. They were also radical militants in the sense that they had to be part of at least three big wars. They began as teenagers almost in the organization of the resistance against the American invasion, the United States American War in, 40, in 47. So first they fought the war against the invading American army. Then they organized the um, war of reform where they basically uh, fought against the power of the reaction which was uh, articulation of the church that owned 75% of the land, the territory in Mexico. The church were the owners of 75% of the land in Mexico. So they fought to expropriate this uh, property from the hands of the reactionary power that is the church in the history of Mexico, right? The center of the colonial project, the Catholic church. and. After that um, victory, when they actually defeat the conservative forces, they come to power and those reactionary forces, right, the conservative party, decides to go to Europe and to lobby in the European monarchies and powers to get an army to invade Mexico. And this is the origin of um, Cinco de Mayo as as, as the battle, this is the, the, the history that uh, makes Cinco de Mayo an important um, date. So when the, just like today, because it's very interesting that the repetition of these forms of uh, subordination and destruction of the other nations, the reason of the invasion, the, the rationale that the European forces is the depth, what is has at that moment is in power, but they are very impoverished and they have an accumulated debt to the European banks. So the reason why the Europeans have excuse to invade Mexico at that moment is because they come to collect the debt. We know that this debt is now also the reason why there is constant aggression from imperial forces against um, the, the independence of nations in Asia, in Africa, in, in, in the Americas. So coming to collect this debt, in reality, Napoleon III uh, has the idea to expand the French empire just the way they had expand, expand already the French empire in the north of Africa. So to continue this new French imperialist project. This is, this is what perhaps is interesting for us to, to think because this has an important side on the American side because all this history, all these radical in indigenous intellectuals that fought you know, multiple wars and invasions in Mexico and against their own reactionary internal forces during the, the, the War of Reform, had a very important um, allyship, an alliance, a political radical alliance with the progressive forces in the United States. So, there is amongst the historians, the idea that there was a series of secret correspondence between the group of Juarez and the group around um, Lincoln and the North to actually execute Maximilian, the Emperor, when finally Juarez 
um, defeated the French Empire. The execution of Maximilian was a big, big affair in the 19th century because imagine Juarez, a 100% uh, Zapotec uh, Indian from Oaxaca, there to order the execution of a, of a royal Augsburg, right? Uh, a prince from one of the most powerful um, monarchic families in Europe. This, this notion of the execution of the kings, right, is a very rare thing in history, is very fascinating. We can really think of only three executions of kings, right? Well, there is the British one, but that one, you know, they immediately with Cromwell decided that, that was terrible and bring back the king and ask for forbiddenness, right? That's what the England is not very ever uh, um, advanced or progressive force in history. But the French execute the monarchy, right? Execute the king. Then the Mexicans execute Maximilian, which is an Augsburg prince, very important. Uh, and then, of course, the Bolsheviks uh, kill the Tsar, right? So it's this moment in which we need to imagine the 19th century racist European dominant discourse and this indigenous ragtag republic, right, with radical ideas like expropriating the property of the church, uh, refusing slavery, trying to make actually an intellectual, um, um, intellectual leadership and political leadership out of indigenous people, right? An indigenous democratic modern nation trying to emancipate itself, to recover their indigenous roots and to base their idea of a nation in an anti-colonial struggle, an anti-imperialist struggle. This is this Mexico of that moment is a very beautiful and heroic, there to kill one of the kings of Europe, right? to make clear, right, they had to split, like the blood of the king will really make a sort of a strange uh, secular ritual. So the, spa the Europeans will never ever again dare to invade the Americas. And the, I say these like this because that's the, the sort of um, correspondence that we know was between Juarez and the North right in the 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 actually after the civil war this is when happens is the the lincoln is already assassinated but that right the ones that had done the emancipation in the united states that group tells juarez go ahead and do it juarez had the support of their own Alice, they've been together on this. So we need to think of Cinco de Mayo as this very interesting moment uh, in which, why is that so important in the United States? Why it becomes the important holiday? Because indeed, the, the, the sort of progressive forces of the United States, the emancipatory radical forces of the United States, the ones that fought the Civil War and eventually, you know, created uh, emancipation and um, the moment of black reconstruction, we can think of all the, the defeats and the way this is, you know, a terrible um, history that, in a sense, we continue to fight here. But those moments were in total alliance with defeating the imperial intentions of the Europeans. That is what the, bat the Battle of Cinco de Mayo represents. And Cinco de Mayo, as a battle, is a battle won by guerrilla tactics, by a ragtag army, of indigenous people that just like Vietnam, and this is what is considered like Vietnam, right? Attack the very heavy artillery of the French and the very, you know, the, the, the basically the French army that had already conquered Algiers and the north of Africa, right? Suffered a totally embarrassing defeat by an indigenous guerrilla. That is who destroyed the French army in that battle. And the first act of uh, restoration of the Republic by Juarez is actually the inauguration of um, uh, uh, a monument, right? A monument to Cuauhtémoc, 
the hero of the resistance of the Aztecs against the invasion of the Spaniards in the, in the 15th century. So we could begin to yeah, remember Cinco de Mayo as this very you know, early 19th century moment of us coming together as indigenous and black, as brown and black, and also as the progressive forces to come together to defeat colonialism, imperialism, military intervention, and the racist uh, uh, forms of oppression that don't allow the indigenous people and the black people, the people who are actually you know, the, the ones that have built these nations and who are the, the core of these nations to recover their history, their radical history within modernity, right, of creating the possibility of us continuing to do this fight. So this memory, to try to like, sort of um, stop thinking of Cinco de Mayo as just some Mexican heritage day, right? Um, and try to understand that actually is this moment of, of, of the sister republics, I call them, right? When, when come together in their most progressive um, tendencies to actually defeat, right? the project of colonialism, the project of imperialism, the project of, and they fight wars of resistance against, or wars of emancipation, right? For the abolition of slavery and to defeat once again, the intentions of colonial imperialist power. So powerful. Uh, thank you all again for joining. Um, it's so important that we recover this revolutionary history so that we know exactly what we're up against, that we remember who we are as those who are in struggle, to know that to know what is possible when we're able to bring together people who may not have been together before and stand up and, and rather rise up against those who are oppressing and exploiting us. For those of us who are in struggle, it is so important that we know this history because those we are up against do know this history. They do know the power of our people coming together, not just within the United States, but within communities around the world who are connected in our material conditions and our want for freedom. And so this history is, is still being fought for and you all are a part of this struggle now. And so we have to carry it on these lessons into how we organize and how we show up for each other in true solidarity and not just in name. And so again, uh, thank you all for joining. I'm gonna pass it over to my dear comrade Moses. I'm so excited for the second half of this panel on the role of art and culture and revolutionary movement. I know Moses, you're gonna introduce Pauline and Moni, but I love them both so much. So I just wanna put that out there, it's recorded. I love you all. Thank you so much for joining and uh, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sierra. So um, as Sierra said, my name is Moses. I am the pretty new Divest from the War Machine organizer here with Code Pink, and I'm really excited to kind of be leading this second part. Um, and so I'm going to be starting by just reading a poem before we kind of start um, uh, with our panel. I thought it would be a good idea to kind of frame the poem a little bit. Um, and I think a lot of it kind of goes hand in hand with what Sierra was saying. And I think, um, you know, watching this video this morning and stuff and thinking a lot about kind of the rewriting of, you know, revolutionary, radical and anti-imperialist histories that the United States does quite frequently. And I think with great intention um, and linking it, you know, to other struggles of, you know, for instance, like the rewriting of the history of May Day. Um, the U.S. is, of course, the only um, country where May Day is not celebrated celebrated, but it's kind of ironic because um, the event that May Day is commemorating actually did happen in Chicago. But the US has really bent over backwards and has done somersaults to reimagine and unrevolutionize and de-radicalize history. And I think something that's so scary about it is actually how much of a role that creativity, art, and culture 
can really go into rewriting these histories. These histories aren't just retold um, or de-radicalized by a president signing an executive order or a Senate passing a bill, those, those things can certainly help. But these histories are also retold through art and culture and the US powers really navigating and understanding the ways in which the masses consume culture and using it to put forward their capitalist and imperialist agendas. And so in this next section, we'll be talking a lot about the critical role of arts and culture and revolution, and also talking about how important it is to commit to really knowing our enemy and really see and study and understand the ways that they are using arts and culture for their own agenda and how we can build a culture to battle that. And I think um, we're gonna be delving into this a lot tonight and understanding really how important the struggle for arts and culture really is and this battle for the narrative. And so I'm just gonna read a quick poem and then we're gonna go into kind of our um, question and answer section. Um, but this is just a poem I wrote a little bit about something we call the mental terrain. We are all soldiers on the mental terrain, whether or not we know it. Every morning we open our eyes, we strap into our armor and wonder how we will move through the world today. How will we read the messages from every direction and facet of our life? Every tab on our computer is a different noise for us to navigate and every TV channel is a new narrative. We hear and read who we're meant to be, how we're meant to organize and how the world should be. We see the silly human interest stories of the war criminal president turned a happy-go-lucky painter. We read emails from university presidents about living wages, healthcare and childcare being too big of a demand for a grad student union. And we're met time and time again with the same argument of this is just how it's always been, so it's how it's meant to be. The battlefield is our hearts, our minds, our thoughts. We're fighting for how we think. Willie Baptist always says that we have to end poverty in our minds before we end poverty with our hands. We're in a fight for the narrative, how to be seen, perceived, and how we will proceed. So never lose sight of the battle for your mind, a lifelong battle, a never ending process. Every day we make our way through a jungle of a thousand different terrible narratives, the narratives of individualism, American exceptionalism or mobilization without organization. And every day we're in a battle for our hearts and thoughts, but we must believe that we are, for, we are fighting for is possible and powerful despite everything that tells us otherwise. The battle is in our streets, but it's also on our TVs and in our computers, and of course, in our minds. So how will you fight? Um, well, thank you. <laughs> and so we're gonna be going on to this next part. We're gonna be talking a little bit more specifically with a couple of different cultural workers and organizers in the movement um, about the role of arts and culture in our work as organizers. And if you'll all indulge me for a second, um, I'm especially excited about these two people that we've invited to speak here tonight, because not only do I feel like these two people have had a really huge impact on this overall movement and the development of leaders and being two really great teachers, but also personally have had a really huge impact on me, um, even if they don't know it. <laughs> um, so the first speaker here tonight is Moni Torres from Pueblos Sin Fronteras who I was actually able to meet this past weekend at the Cosecha mobilization in DC in person, which was awesome. But I first knew about Moni and a course with the University of the Poor, where she was my first ever revolutionary philosophy teacher and the first ever philosophy teacher that I have ever had who made me feel like I would actually be able to grasp concepts and pillars of philosophy. And so I owe a lot to Moni. Um, and secondly, we have Pauline Pisano, um, who uh, is currently with the New York State Poor People's Campaign and also kind of transitioning into a role with the Maryland PPC. And I also have a super special relationship with Pauline, both as friends as an artist through the University of the Poor and at Code Pink. And I'm just so excited to have her here tonight. Um, and so thank you guys so much. Um, and so we thought we would start a little bit tonight um, by just getting to know Pauline and Moni a little bit more. Um, this is a pretty, this is a pretty big question to start with. And sometimes people get like mad at me when I ask it, but I do think it is important as organizers to hear other organizers journeys because I think it helps us a lot to know that we probably were struggling with the same ideas and kind of um, structures and stuff like that. 
And so um, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about your own political development, kind of what brought you um, into organizing today and really if there's anything that shaped you. And so we can go ahead. I don't know if Moni, you'd like to start. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks for that. And I think, thanks for everybody who has been part of, of this um, so far. And well, I'm, I'm so happy that that now you want to study philosophy. This is so, this is the greatest thing that I've received the whole day. So uh, I hope that that encourages others to also study philosophy. Um, no, I, so I'm, my name is Moni uh, and I'm very happy to be here with y'all. I work with an organization called Pueblos Sin Fronteras and we have been accompanying migrants uh, in both uh, throughout caravans and in migrant shelters uh, in, in, the United, in Mexico and the United States. So very happy to be here with y'all and, um, and the compas are also here with me as well. So very, very excited. Uh, I mean, I was born in Mexico uh, in, a, in a rural uh, town in, in Jalisco, Mexico, where uh, I was constantly bombarded with a family that was constantly engaging in uh, you know, composing music, composing poetry. Uh, my grandma possibly is the best poet I ever, I've ever known. She knows every song out there for every occasion and for every region of Mexico. So I, I grew up in that type of culture and that type of, of, of uh, environment where cre creativity was encouraged, um, where when we were hungry, we sang. When we were lonely, we sang. Uh, when we were happy, we sang. So I was thinking about this as I was preparing for this conversation. And I was like, you know what? I remember sitting, uh, you know, at, in the soccer fields with my father just before he had to migrate to the United States because he migrated before us and singing that song, Estrellita Marinera, right? Uh, Dame razón de mi amor. Tell me where my love is going because he's going to the north and I don't know if I'm ever going to see him again. Um, and then I also remember that, that song um, saying, uh, pueblo mío que estás en la colina, uh, tirado como un viejo que se muere. My old town who's hitting under the hill, dying like an old man. Um, so these are things that I think are accompanied and have accompanied throughout my whole uh, life. Uh, from that to being with the compas, being a, a restaurant worker for my whole life, uh, having that salsa or that cumbia come up or the corrido, right? And the compas saying, you know, that's the song that I used to dedicate to my girlfriend back in Mexico before I had to migrate. And I haven't seen in years. So all of that is something that accompanies me, something that had been here. I have been organizing within the migrant movement for the past 10 years. Uh, and I'm so happy and I'm so excited to be here um, and to talk a little bit more about what is this question of art? What is this, how do we think about art? How do we engage art and how do we create it? So more or less, I'll leave it there and I'll pass it over uh, to my friend Pauline. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, it's so amazing to be here. Um, uh, yeah, you know, so my, my, I guess my political development started with some objective conditions for me in 2008. And so um, I've always been an artist, um, you know, by all standards, a <laughs> failed artist within this capitalist system, right? But we're, we're gonna unpack a little bit about what that actually, like the mythology of that, um, but, you know, in 2008, uh, I lost my job. Oh, I think you muted yourself, Pauline. How many times are we going to say that during this meeting? Um, but uh, yeah, you know, so in 2008, uh, you know, lost my job, uh, was on unemployment for 99 weeks. And I think that's, for me, that's really the turning point of when I started to really understand that there was something else happening. I thought, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. I moved to New York. I went to, you know, Tisch School of the Arts. I thought I was doing everything right. Um, and then everything kind of fell fell underneath me um, in that moment. And I, and I was struggling to really find answers to what happened and why it happened. And there was a lot of self-blame and self-critique about stuff and then and then a movement came along that really kind of heightened the contradictions of this uh society that we're in and that was standing rock and so standing rock really called me into an organizing space where i started to really actually question these structures um and then through there a lot of my friends that were a part of the standing rock um joined the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival. And so that's when I met Sierra. Uh, that's when I met some people that are on this call. And it was a part of the 40 days of moral action and arts and culture was a huge part of it. And so from my history of being an artist, I always felt like artists were isolated from the base of people, that artists are somewhat separate from, from others. And that, you know, where 
you know, we're meant to suffer and we're separate and get, you know, all, all those things that are not actually real. Um, and so through that, I actually found cultural arts organizing and I began to go through a liberatory process in my own mind, but then with my community. And I started to kind of um, break, break down these walls of what it means to be an artist. And I began to really understand, um, and I'm still understanding, this individualistic world that we live in um, and this hyper individualist world that we live in and how dehumanizing it is for everybody. Because the reality is, is that everyone is an artist, you know, that this division of deciding who gets to do what is actually a part of a capitalist um, individualist structure. And so, you know, I was called into the movement, I think from the changing conditions. And I think that relates a lot to what people are going through today. Um, so I guess I'll leave that there and I'll wait for the next question. Thank you. No, that, I mean, that is beautiful. And, you know, I feel like that rings to something that someone in the movement, I mean, Anu tells us a lot, which is of course, um, everyone is a creative genius. Um, and part of our work as cultural workers is really bringing that out of people and kind of having them understand that, that we're all born with this beautiful ability to create, right? And I think kind of this concept also of this feeling that I relate to, because I'm also like in the capitalist framework, like a failed artist. So <laughs> um, I relate to that very much, but I think what a lot of that kind of has to go into is kind of this concept of mental terrain um, that we, uh, I talked a little bit about the poem and mental terrain is something that really informs our work um, and not only on an artistic level, but also very much on like a political level and understanding strategy and messaging and really just like a huge struggle that we're battling with every single day in our organizing. And so I think it would be interesting if we kind of unpack what mental terrain is a little bit more specifically. Um, I know it's a big question and it encompasses a lot of things, um, but I think it would be a really worthwhile question to start with. So I don't know if either of you wanna give it a shot. I can kind of dive in and then <laughs> Moni can add to my constant evolving understanding of what mental terrain is. But it's, um, I understand that uh, mental terrain is really about where we're coming from. And these mythologies that, you know, these compartments that we, that we place feelings of self and collective within it. So I'm thinking, you know, American exceptionalism, I'm thinking of, um, you know, like, oh, like, uh, private property, ownership, like, you know, th things that kind of get into where we're coming from. And I, and I think, you know, it's really about the myths that we've been told of where we are. And so the contradictions that can come out of like understanding where people's mental terrain is kind of creates this bridge of remembering. I'm hearing a lot of rem like a remembering of who we are. Um, but just thinking about, you know, the the conditions and the rules that we have in our head and when our conditions uh, challenge those, that's really an interesting place where we can think about imagining a new way of being. But we have to kind of understand a little bit about, you know, where we're coming from. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, the way I think I, 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 and I think uh, what they alluded to this a little bit on the notion of the mental terrain and it's, it's, it's how our, every aspect of our life in its totality is actually conditioned uh, by a capitalist mindset, by commodifying everything, right? Everything is something that could be sold. Uh, everything is something that, uh, that has the potentiality to, to, to be sold. And I think that's something that um, is, is, is very important for us to, if we want to live in a world that fights against um, poverty, that fights against imperialism, we have to change that, that, that mindset, right, of uh, how do we actually live in a world where we value what is necessary, where we value um, uh, life in general, not just profit, not just the potentiality of accumulation. Um, and I think this is very important when it comes to art, right? Um, how do we, uh, you know, art I think helps us paint the world that uh, is currently denied and therefore like assumes that such worth, such world is worth living and fighting for uh, and that is a better world. And I think that's when we engage very significantly the question of the mental terrain. We then start thinking about art not as something abstract, right? Something that 
you know, more or less, but we start thinking about art as a question of political strategy. Uh, we start thinking about, uh, you know, it, um, uh, Jose Maria, Maria, Jose Maria Mariate, he talks about this idea of, of building socialism in Latin America it has to be a new invention, a historic and a heroic creation. And I think it's very important for us to think about uh, art in that way, right? We have to take it with the seriously, uh, seriousness that, that, that embarks. And, and then we talk about the question of, of hegemony, right? How are we gonna win? How are we actually going to provide other alternatives that not only create fans of art that we're creating, right? Or people are singing our songs. No, we actually not only want fans, we wanna create fellow activists, fellow comrades who are gonna be uh, with us engaging a fight against capitalism and imperialism in general. So more or less is that. Uh, our fight today for uh, against the mental terrain and, and, and to win the mental terrain is to develop a political strategy and political organization that has the capacity to win and to engage in a voluntary um, process where people want to be not only our fans when we sing, but they want to be our comrades as well. So I think that's, that's more or less how we put it. Yeah, no, that is beautiful. And it makes me think too of kind of something that I remember um, Pauline told me once and I don't have it in front of me. Um, so I'm not gonna quote it just right, but basically talking about how, you know, um, arts and culture can really reach you in a, such a special way and really bring you in for further kind of political development and further kind of political education. And it's such a beautiful way to kind of bring people together, you know? And I think when I first kind of started organizing, um, I was coming off of like, you know, a, a bad arts experience. And so I was like, I am ready to abandon the struggle of arts and culture. It has no place anywhere. It's all the ruling class. And I was like, I'm over it. And I think there are some spaces that do do that. They really kind of abandon that struggle. They don't want to think about it and stuff like that. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit more. And you already talked about it a little bit, but um, his, both historically and practically, why is this something like arts and culture, something that we can't abandon, but something that we actively have to keep learning and understanding and studying? Because we're human. You know, like when I thought about these questions, like we're hu we're human beings, you know, this whole um, uh, I studied a little bit of sound and I studied the physics of sound. And so I'm, I'm thinking also mental terrain, like we're thinking about, you know, um, we can talk a little bit about pragmatism and its relationship to imperialism. And like, if something is useful, does that make it true as opposed to like, is it there? And so sound is lit it, it goes to that question you know, if a tree falls in the woods and no one's around to hear it, does it make a sound? The answer is yes, it does. Sound is a physical force. It moves molecules in elastic medium. Like that's what it is, right? So we, you know, thinking about organizing uh, or being alive without arts and culture is we're, we're talking about a dehumanization of people. And, and through that dehumanization, we divide people. And so I, you know, for, for me, and I think for us in general, the process is not thinking about that, but doing it with people, you know, like Moses and I, like we had an understanding through like doing a collaborative project. And so I think that, you know, that, and that's why I really gravitated towards the poor people's campaign because it really emphasized that working with people in collaboration, because that's the liberatory action because the new world is being born today. And, it, and, and, we, and we're gonna fight for that, right? Because we're gonna love being in that space. Oh, definitely. I think if we look at all the important uh, political and revolutionary movements in the past, uh, they've had a significant aspect of art that is attached to them. I mean, we think of, for example, we think of the Black Panthers and we think about a whole attire that comes with them. There's a whole aesthetic. There's an optic to it. Uh, we think about the, uh, the, the Russian Revolution. We think about the Chinese Revolution. We think about the Cuban Revolution. We think about the songs of Silvio. Uh, you know, we think about the Nicaraguan uh, revolution, we think of all these revolutions that are attached to this. And I think um, we can, if we really want to win, and if we're really engaging against uh, a, a really an imperialist project, uh, we really have to think again I, uh, of art as, 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 as we think of political strategy. I'm going to keep on pushing that. Um, and I think uh, as long as freedom remains for humanity and an, an alien object, um, it's, it's something that we're going to have to engage significantly, I think, as 
Thomas like Sankara would say, uh, with courageous discipline and passionate struggle, right? Like we have to constantly engage this question. Um, I think Mariana, uh, you know, uh, they, uh, talked about what were the progressive forces uh, that actually um, worked together during uh, the Battle of Cinco de Mayo to, to fight against the imperialist um, forces of the time. And I, th I, and I often think of that today. Um, I think about what's necessary. I think about the battle of ideas. Uh, I think about how do we engage in, in a political project that has a potentiality of not only understanding the past, but also painting a future. And I think that is the beauty of, of art itself, right? It, it has a, a, a memory, but it also has the, pot the potentiality to really, really ground us and also to color the path towards the future. And that's what art does. It contributes and it connects the future and the now and makes it possible. And I think in, in, in a space where we're in constant struggle, right? Uh, consciousness, you know, it's, it's, it's only an objective possibility. It's always threatened, right? By the seduction of the now of capitalist ideology. So what is it gonna take for us uh, to really create a culture where people voluntarily want to engage and want to sing our songs and want to sing our chants and are singing our chants when they're cleaning you know, the dishes and when they're with their family and how do we create even more cultural artists? And I think a significant question that we can think about here is when does the cultural artist um, really engage in this question is when they become a militant, when a political strategy um, and, and when an idea of a future informs the way they do art um, and vice versa, right? So I think more or less, uh, uh, that's, that's more or less how I understand this. If we really want to win, we have to take on very serious the question of the battle of ideas. And we have to think of art as part of, the, of a political strategy in order to win. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that was beautiful. And um, just such a testament to why it's so imperative that we really don't abandon kind of this mental terrain and kind of this huge part of our struggle. And so I guess I'd also like to ask kind of more specifically about the role of arts and culture in your own work and specific examples of stuff that you've done in your organizations and your organizing and stuff like that. So it'd just be great to hear if there's anything that comes to mind, whether it be projects or, you know, anything like that. I think it started maybe. Um, I mean, I, again, like I said in the past, we've worked with um, you know migrant caravans that you know go from you know five hundred people to fifteen thousand people at a time. So how does one communicate with so many people living in such precarious conditions? Uh, we have chants, right? Uh, La Compas developed chants on the spot. Uh, we had, um, for example, we have our own radio station that constantly engages the people on the terrain and the people uh, outside um, and provides that type of connection. Uh, a lot of compas produce a lot of poetry. At a certain point uh, uh, in, in the smaller caravans, they actually received notebooks where they would write their stories and they would write you know, what was going on throughout their journey. Um, in, in detention, in the battles in detention, we've actually engaged in significant art projects uh, where um, uh, people send in our, their art and we put it forward to the public. And uh, we've made different things like this that, are, that have really significantly helped us and constantly are making music. Again, our process has been significantly collective. It's not only like money makes this or money had the idea. No, it's actually a, a process of, of, of collective creation of like, if, if maybe I like pop music, but the Copas love reggaeton, so let's make a reggaeton. So it's, it's that question, uh, right? Of what, what is it? What, what is it gonna move people? And, and what are, are not only the demands that the people have, but what are the demands that could get us somewhere else? So it's, you know, balancing that. Uh, so I, I often think of, of that. Um, and there's, I mean, there's, we've done other several things, but I think uh, what comes to mind right now is it's a radio station that we're reamping again, uh, that everybody could find uh, in our website and, um, and we're excited for it. So that's, that's one of the things that we're more, more most proud about. That's so exciting. I was, I, I can't wait to, that's amazing. Um, uh, 
that actually just made me think of a Gloria Anzal do a quote actually about airwaves. Um, uh, like, uh, like radio waves are thoughts, consciousness, travel on air and impact others. So really the arts and culture work is about us. Um, imagination, imagination offers resolutions out of the conflict by dreaming alternative waves, alternative ways of imagining, feeling, and thinking, and it's all through love. And so I'm thinking, you know, in Poor People's Campaign, me a national call for more revival meetings, they all start with music. And it's not just to say, okay, you know, this is, this is, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna put a song in the beginning, we're gonna put a song in the end. It's about, we're actually gonna call our total humanity into the space and we're, and and we're going to develop these songs with one another um you know and so we kind of start there and so we think about people that uh you know in the work in the work that we do i think we're thinking about people that don't see themselves as creative beings because that's a part of a liberatory process and then we're thinking about people that did see themselves as creative beings but they don't see themselves as a part of a collective because that's what happened to the art world and so bringing bringing these voices together and sharing our story is unbelievably healing because it's breaking us out of the isolation of who we are. Um, so I, I think about those those projects and then how we can bring them all together to look like one united front is really important. And so one thing that we're doing in the New York State Poor People's Campaign is we're looking at our, our music songbook history, um, setting those songs and then creating a bunch of new pieces together in collaboration. We're gonna have like a, I, I just wanna be in preschool my whole life. I wanna make art and take naps. And so we're gonna have a summer art school process, um, you know, and, and thinking about one, pushing the collaborative part, but also calling in people that might not necessarily have seen themselves uh, to be a part of that process, because again, it's about us being human and remembering our history, and we are being organized culturally all the time. I was in my car the other day listening to a song on the radio, and I was like, oh, you know, this, this drum beat sounds great, and then I listened to the lyrics, and I was like, I'm being organized in a capitalist way right now, and I'm so annoyed that even for 15 seconds I listened to this song, um, you know, and, and so thinking about ways that we can actually call people in through through these through this avenue um and and bring in our principles and our values because they're deeply human and interconnected and you know building this movement to end poverty um building this movement to be fully human with one another i think is super important so you know i th i think the work can happen in in many in many ways and i think anyone on this call you know after this after this meeting write down in a journal and a poem and call your friend and share it with your friend and talk about how it's affected you in your life uh, well i just want to say thank you both so much i was so excited and nervous today i was like i'm gonna be talking to paulina moni i have to prepare as much as possible and i feel like i've been able to learn so much from y'all not only tonight but just through our journey together as organizers and so i want to thank you both so much for coming tonight it was amazing um and i don't know if there's anything you want to close with but otherwise i think i'll go ahead and pass it back to sierra and thank you both so much Just thank you all so much. This is really great to be in this space and, and to everyone listening. Thank you. I must end with a poem. If anybody knows me, they know that I always have a poem. Um, and this is a poem that I, I really, really love and it's by a revolutionary Salvadorian uh, poet. And I think many of you know who I'm talking about. And it's a poem, I'll read it in Spanish really quick and I'll read it in English after. And it's called Como Tú by Roque Dalton. Uh, it says, Yo, como tú, amo el amor, la vida, el dulce encanto de las cosas, el, paila, el paisaje celeste de los días de enero. También mi sangre bulle y río por los ojos que han conocido el gote de las lágrimas. Creo que el mundo es bello, que la poesía es como el pan de todos. Y que mis venas no terminan en mí, sino en la sangre unánime de los que luchan por la vida, el amor, las cosas, el paisaje y el pan. La poesía de todos. So are you in English now? I, like you, I love love life, uh, the sweet smell of things, the blue, the sky blue landscape of January days. And my blood boils up and I laugh through my eyes that have known the buds of tears. I believe the world is beautiful and that poetry like bread is for everyone. And that my veins don't end in me, but in the unanimous blood of those who struggle for life, for love, for little things, the landscape and bread, the poetry of everybody. 
So thank you so much. And thanks for everybody that's here today. Ah, this is so beautiful. Thank you so much for this discussion. Um, I mean, one, I'm just so happy to see your faces, uh, but also you all are dropping gems. So I have, speaking of notebooks, lots of notes. Um, so thank you all for that. And uh, I also want to thank uh, Michelle, Terry, Leonardo of the Latin American team uh, for hosting this and Michelle for like, tech and then all the incredible video work and everything um michelle just like always holds us down and so thank you so much for that team again uh we just felt like this conversation on the revolutionary history of cinco de mayo was so important to hold uh this is a history where you had a big force this gigantic imperialist force that is france supported by the former slaveholders in the United States and a quest for more property and a quest to expand slavery after it had been uh, ended in the United States against a people who had this incredible, have this incredible political project of liberation, one that emancipated people from slavery long before the United States even did, uh, starting in 1810. And this, 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 this force, three times bigger than this ragtag guerrilla group of, of, of 2,000 uh, untrained soldiers versus 6,000 uh, French soldiers. And out of this battle, these incredible revolutionaries of, of this Mexican project for liberation for all came out kick the ass of these imperialists and you know they left with 100 you know less than 100 um 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 uh, uh mexican soldiers dead but they took 500 french down with them and so just think again how incredible this history is and what a, a, a lesson it is for those of us who are in struggle today to know that when we are able to unite, we are able to win, we are able to do battle with an incredible, uh, a force that seems almost insurmountable. And so for far too long, the United States government has conceived of Latin America and the Caribbean as its backyard. And it is though uh, that perspective that the US has carried out its foreign policy of exploitation and control for most of the past 200 years. There was a brief period during the New Deal era in the United States uh, that understood the need to be a good neighbor. And this is a concept that we desperately want to, uh, to revive today. And just in the framework of the Green New Deal, change the discourse on US environmental policy, progressives need to frame a good neighbor policy for the 21st century that will improve our relations within the regional community. And so the Latin American team has been working on this incredible uh, good neighbor policy that will work uh, to end US imperialism in, um, and uh, to respect and appreciate differences, to so just stop meddling with the affairs of, 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 you know, of, of these political projects, these revolutionary political projects. And let's work together for the common good. So I put the link for the good neighbor policy in the chat. Again, the incredible Latin American team has been doing um, this work to really get this around before we leave, I know we're running over a little bit, but for those of you who don't know, um, the Colombian people have been carrying out for the last six days against a neoliberal uh, model crisis. Um, and we reject the brutal repression that has been unleashed by the national government led by Ivan Duque against millions of protesters that have taken to the streets and legitimately used their constitutional rights protest. And we reject the announcement that happened on the May 1st to call the army to control the street 
points and key points of mobilization for the strike. I know we're over time. I just want you all to know that there is an incredible struggle that is being waged in Colombia right now. Again, of a people who are against this huge oppressive force. And just think about how can we be in solidarity with these revolutionaries um, and the way in which uh, Mexican revolutionaries were in solidarity with abolitionists um, and those who fought for the emancipation of chattel slavery in the United States or the emancipation of, of enslaved black workers in the United States. And so thank you all so much. This has been super dope. Uh, this has been such a pleasure and uh, Again, the, uh, the link to the good neighbor policy is in the chat. Moni put the link for Pueblo Sin Fronteras. I am linking that in the chat as well. And the poem that we opened with, with Luis Rodriguez uh, of California, of uh, Los Angeles, I'm putting that in the chat as well, this beautiful poem about the, the revolutionary history of Cinco de Mayo. You all have a wonderful, wonderful night. Stay safe. Um, Go with love and we will see you soon. <laughs> Thanks.